And that is a debate on motion 4051 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on economy ferries. And I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alex Cole Hamilton to speak to and move the motion. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the situation at Ferguson Marine has been called many things a fiasco, a scandal, a farce. It has been described as the height of incompetence and a complete mess. While these descriptions are no doubt accurate, it is important that Parliament does not become obsessed with process and pantomime and lose sight of the real life impact this has as a result. Because the reality is this situation is harming communities every single day. This isn't just a parliamentary soap opera. There are communities to whom promises were made. Presiding officer, those promises were not kept. That is what our debate is about today, being open about how these communities came to experience years of disruption with years more disruption still to come. The stories they have to tell illustrate the impact of shocking government mismanagement. Last week, the BBC reported the plight of an 81-year-old couple from Arran and the lengths they had to go to to attend a hospital appointment in Kilmarnock. What should have been a simple return uh, journey turned into an exhausting 94-mile detour involving three ferry crossings. This elderly couple were forced to choose between making this gruelling journey or paying for a three-day hotel stay for a 30-minute appointment. Or oh, there's the story of the young couple with a newborn baby forced to abandon their car on the mainland when their ferry home was cancelled. Their story becomes more harrowing when you consider they'd just been discharged from hospital, that the baby had been born prematurely and that the mother was recovering from caesarean section. And just yesterday, locals from Arran have learned that the ferry serving the main route uh, between their island and the mainland will be out of action until at least Friday following an engine failure. We must also remember the damage being done to the local economy of these places and the tourism that these islands rely on. CalMac's managing director has accepted that services are at a really difficult point. His words, presiding officer. The average, Calmac, the average age of CalMac's ferries is fast approaching 23 years, while more than a quarter of their major vessels are past their 30-year design life. And whether, whenever a sailing is cancelled, there is no spare vessel to cover the journey and to serve its customers. Which is why it was music to people's ears when the announcement came that two new vessels were to be built at Ferguson Marine on the Clyde to serve our island communities, including Arran. Work was originally supposed to be completed in 2018. We're now told they will be ready in 2023. For our island communities, it's very much a case of I'll believe it when I see it. Even if this time the ferries have real windows made out of glass in a funnel that's actually doing something other than providing accommodation for seagulls, islanders will still be forced to wait. They will still be subject to horrendous delays, cancellations and the uncertainty that comes with that. Presiding officer, it's an all too familiar story for our island communities. They've been dealing with this for years, long before this scandal was splashed across our national newspapers. In truth, this latest debacle is only adding insult to an injury sustained a long time ago. Those who dared to believe that the government's promise to fix this situation are now left doubly disappointed and angry. And to make things worse, it seems that absolutely nobody is being held to account for this failure. The Scottish Government website states that an open government gives the public information about the decisions it makes. It supports people to understand and to influence those decisions and values and encourages accountability and responsibility for those decisions. Well, Scottish Liberal Democrats thought today was a good opportunity to review the Scottish Government's progress in those areas and in those aims. But when it comes to sharing information about decisions, nobody can say how the Government came to decide to give the contract to Ferguson Marine in the first place. In fact, Audit Scotland couldn't get to the bottom of it because there was no paper trail. We're talking about the decision towards, uh, to award a then £100 million contract in the face of warnings from CMAL. Open government also aims to support people to influence decisions, but presiding officer, no one could claim 
the islanders have been at the heart of this process. In fact, decisions were reportedly being taken because they fit in with the SNP conference timetable, not because they were necessarily the right decisions for islanders. What about the lofty aim of encouraging accountability and responsibility? Well, we've had the finance secretary telling us she couldn't say who made the decision. Then the first minister dancing around who gave the sign off before conveniently attaching it to Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, it is awfully convenient for Nicola Sturgeon that the latest scandal threatening her government and indeed her premiership can be neatly blamed on someone who has since departed politics. But if we're to take the First Minister at her word, Derek Mackay should appear before Parliament to give his side of the story and to confirm that the First Minister and the rest of her cabinet had no input into the deal set to cost the taxpayer hundreds of millions more than originally scheduled. The public and our island communities deserve answers and they deserve accountability. Presiding officer, this open government is asking us to believe that a £100 million contract was awarded on the, SMP, the eve of SNP conference without the direct involvement of a famously precise First Minister. A First Minister who has famously remarked that she didn't say don't go ahead whatever that means. A First Minister who has ranked the government's acquisition of the Ferguson shipyard amongst her proudest achievements. A First Minister who has refused to apologise to the island communities affected by this calamity. Presiding officer, they deserve better. In 2014, Nicola Sturgeon became First Minister. In 2016, she described the Ferguson shipyard as going from strength to strength. It is now 2022 and there is not a ship in sight. Scotland used to be the proudest shipbuilding nation on this planet. In the 20th century, over 30,000 vessels were built in shipyards on the Clyde, whereas in the 21st century, this government, government can barely manage two. Oh, how lamentably far we have fallen under SNP leadership. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Ivan McKee to speak to and move amendment 4051.3 up to six minutes, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And President Officer, I'm very well aware, as this, uh, this government, of course, that for many in Scotland, ferries are an essential lifeline. Our island communities rely on them for access to employment, health provision, education, and to see their loved ones. And ferries are essential to support a vibrant and growing tourism sector and sustain local businesses, enabling the distribution of products and providing vital supplies to support local trade. And through this government's policies, we have delivered considerable growth in services underpinned by significant investments in vessels and infrastructure. This has already seen orders placed for two new vessels for Isla, as well as investments in ports at UAE, Lochmadie and Tarbert. And work is well underway on uh, designs for the small vessel replacement a programme that will benefit Danoon and Kilcreggan. There will be further major vessel replacements for Mull and South Hughes, as well as replacement freight ships for Orkney and Shetland. This government is committed to supporting island communities and ferry users. Holy Rennie. For taking an intervention. If that's all true, why do the ferries keep breaking down and why do the islanders keep on waiting for new ferries? Minister. I made very clear this government is committed to expanding the fleet, providing new vessels as quickly as we can, and that significant investment that I've men mentioned of £580 million is testament to that. President officer, this government also supports Scottish industry. We support the continuation of shipbuilding on the Clyde and support skilled employment at Ferguson Marine. This, I have to say, stands in stark contrast to many on the opposition benches in this parliament. Those with long memories longer than mine in the chamber will, of course, remember when the Liberal Democrats were in government and responsible for procuring ferries, they were prepared to let Ferguson's close. So their opportunism in bringing this motion today will not go unnoticed. This government also fully recognises the importance of lifeline ferry networks to island and remote communities. And that's why the infrastructure investment programme sets out our commitment to invest that £580 million. We accept that the delivery of ferries has faced challenges. But this Scottish Government is crystal clear what we expect from Ferguson Marine in terms of delivering vessels 801 and 802, as well as turning the business around to make it competitive. And I fully recognise the critical nature of completing those vessels for the sake of island communities and many people that are dependent on that being the case. Liam Kerr. Grateful. So, given that, what does the Minister say about reports that the equipment, the engines on the Glen Sanex and Hull 802, might actually be out of date? Minister. 
Uh, the member will be aware that uh, clearly because of the delays, there is work ongoing and ongoing on a regular basis to assess the situation of, uh, of parts that have been purchased previously in terms of their fitness for purpose. But in, in terms of the specifics he is talking about, uh, I am not aware of the specifics on that. But if he has got any information on that, I would be delighted for him to, uh, to pass, that, uh, pass that through. Um, I will turn and talk a wee bit about the Audit Scotland report that sets out the challenges that we took on when we rescued Ferguson's from administration in 2019, much of which has already been considered by this Parliament's Rural Economy Committee in the last Parliament and debated here in this chamber on several occasions. The decision we took saved hundreds of jobs and it saved the future of commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde, and it was the right thing to do. We stand by the commitment to the shipbuilding communities in Inverclyde and the island communities that rely on the vessels the yard will deliver. The Audit Scotland report says that the turnaround of Ferguson's is extremely challenging and it highlights that FMPG has implemented some of the significant operational improvements that were required at the shipyard. The challenges have indeed been great. The initial report on the state of the yard in December 2019 sets out the scale and depth of the business turnaround required to put Ferguson Marine onto a stable footing. COVID has slowed the turnaround efforts. The yard has twice had to shut down due to the pandemic. It has worked at reduced capacity for many months as a result of the implementation of necessary distancing requirements and the impact of COVID, sickness, absence and self-isolation. But despite these significant challenges, progress has been made. The new permanent chief exec has been in post since February. He brings a fresh vision and a new approach. A more collaborative culture is in place, working much more closely with CMAL. Jamie I thank the uh, Minister for taking the intervention. The Audit Scotland report says there is no documented evidence to confirm why ministers were willing to accept the risk of awarding the contract to um, FML. Despite CML's concerns, we consider there should have been proper record of this important decision. Why wasn't there a proper record of the decision? And does he agree with me that it's, it could be a breach of the Ministerial Code of Conduct to not have proper record keeping? Minister. The member will be aware there's more than, or should be aware there's more than 200 documents have already been put into the, the public domain uh, with regards to uh, the, 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 the issues that he's talking about, and there's full information in there as regards to the process that's been going through previously um, over the period that the Scottish Government has been involved in, uh, in this process. But, President Officer, let me be very clear with Parliament today that this Government expects the Yard as a priority to complete the vessel successfully at the fastest, most achievable pace. We expect the Yard to turn around its operations so that it is competitive, productive and efficient, and we expect the Yard to win and secure a further pipeline of work on the basis of its operations. Presiding officer, as I said, this Government has now released 200, more than 200 documents in two tranches, with the most recent being in March of this year. We undertook the most recent release um, because the Audit Scotland report made reference to a range of reports and complex structures, and it was precisely in the interest of openness and transparency that we proactively published those documents on the Scottish Government websites. These documents will, I hope, help those with a less than full understanding of the issues involved get a better picture of all aspects of this situation. This is a demonstration of this Government's commitment to open government that gives the public information about the decisions it makes, supports people to understand and influence those decisions, and values and encourages accountability. Presiding officer, in closing, um, this Government recognises the value of uh, supporting Scottish jobs, supporting Scottish communities and supporting Scottish shipbuilding. That is why we took the decisions we did to keep Ferguson's operational and that is why we work to make sure those ferries are delivered um, according to the timeline. And, President Officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call on Graeme Simpson to speak to and move amendment 4051.1. Up to five minutes, please. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the uh, Liberal Democrats for bringing the issue of ferries back to the Chamber. Since we used our own debating time on ferries, very little has changed. Islanders on Arran are again without a ferry because it's broken down. And no one has accepted responsibility for handing the contract for vessels 801 and 802 to FML against the advice of the government's own experts. No one has yet explained why that was done, and no minister, former or current, has held their hands up. Not Derek Mackay, not his then boss, Keith Brown, not John Swinney, who signed the cheques, and not Nicola Sturgeon. We may find out more when the Auditor General appears before the Public Audit Committee tomorrow, and who knows what we may hear if Mr Mackay 
is invited to give evidence. We agree with the Lib Dem motion, which ultimately calls on ministers to be accountable and to fall on their swords if need be. Frankly, that should have happened already. We've rehearsed the arguments over the Ferguson contract. The ferries are years late and vastly over budget. Had the government listened to CMAL, islanders could have had new ferries by now and the taxpayer would have saved a fortune. Ferguson's may well have survived without needing to be nationalised. And remember, when it was nationalised, ministers had no idea what they were taking on. They didn't know what condition the vessels were in. They went in blind, and frankly, that has shown. We do know well, that... I yes, I will. Minister. Is the position that we should have allowed the shipyard to close at that point in time and made no progress at all on those two ferries? Graham Simpson. The Minister well knows that nobody has said that, despite what he said earlier. Nobody wants Ferguson's to close. We do know that the vessel launched by the First Minister in 2017 had deteriorated by the time Tim Hare wrote an update report in December 2019. It has suffered two years of marine growth and was going to have to be taken out of the water. Perhaps if that photo op hadn't taken place, things would have been better. There was extensive internal degradation too. The procurement of 801 and 802 is a scandal. Heads should have rolled and they haven't. We've called in our amendment, which I move, for an explanation as to why CMAL was ignored. We know the answer, of course. It was so there could be an announcement at the SNP conference. We're also calling for the Project Neptune report to be published immediately. This is not the first time I've asked for this in the Chamber. Jenny Gilruth has promised to let us have it, but she has yet to deliver. She should be open and transparent and publish it in full because we need to start having an honest debate about how we run our ferry services in future. The current model is not fit for purpose. There is some urgency about this, Presiding Officer. The current contract for CalMac to run the West Coast services is up in less than two years. And the Government should have signalled its intentions by now, and whatever model it chooses, started to either make changes or launch a new bidding process. All this dithering does, all this dithering does not help the islanders, who are the people who really matter. They need the certainty of knowing there will be a reliable service with new, more efficient ferries every year. They've been let down by the SNP. Nicola Sturgeon has expressed her regret over the ferry situation, but when asked at the weekend why she won't apologise to islanders, she said, oh, for goodness sake, the last thing islanders who are suffering from a woeful ferry service need is a snotty response from the First Minister. Oh, for goodness sake, is not the answer to people who can't get to hospital appointments, who can't make family gatherings, who can't get to work, who can't run their businesses effectively. An apology would help, but actually the Transport Minister, who isn't here today, needs to decide if she thinks the current model is the right one. And I would say that a system uh, that has herself, followed by Transport Scotland, followed by CMAL, followed by CalMAC, is not a good place to start. She should consider models used in Canada or Norway, and she should consider issuing more than one contract for the West Coast that could allow operators like Western Ferries, for instance, to bid for routes. Presiding officer, we need to see action on ferries, and we need ministers to take responsibility. Our islanders deserve nothing less. Thank you. I now call on Neil Bibby to speak to and move Amendment 4051.2 up to four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this debate uh, brought forward by the Liberal Democrats. Today, the Parliament has just debated the cost of living. Now we are debating the cost of this Government's failure. Severe and unacceptable delays to vessels 801 and 802, which have already cost the taxpayer £250 million. Pounds. Ministers say the process leading to cost overruns and delays was normal, as if there is nothing to see here. As Graham Simpson said, let's see what the Auditor-General has to say about this at the Public Audit Committee 
tomorrow. The truth is, this is one of the biggest public procurement failures in 20 years, and the failure to deliver these vessels on time and on budget has deprived islanders of the lifeline ferry services that they need. Islanders in Arran yet again feeling the impact this week of being reliant on old ferries in desperate need of replacement. I believe now, as I believed in 2014, that the long-term solution is a national ferry building programme, and I believe now, as I believed then, that any replacement programme can bring new opportunities to Ferguson's and the Lower Clyde. Scottish Labour have no truck with those who would have let Ferguson jobs go to the wall. We will always stand by the dedicated, professional, blameless workforce at Ferguson's. But nobody can excuse the failures and the mismanagement that has led us to where we are now and that puts those jobs at risk. Audit Scotland found a multitude of failings, and there are still aspects of this scandal which Audit Scotland did not look at, such as the procurement of decisions prior to August 2015 and the adequacy of vessel designs. There are further questions Parliament should expect answers to, such as why the Government appointed turnaround director who earned £2 million did not turn around the yard. President officer, transparency and accountability are essential if we are to fully understand what went wrong and have confidence that the Government can put it right. So let me be clear about what Scottish Labour believe must happen next. There must be a full public inquiry. There must be clarity about ministerial decisions in relation to the award of contracts without full refund guarantees. There must be maximum transparency. The documents the Scottish Government released over two years ago were released under Derek Mackay, the minister they are now trying to blame for this fiasco. And there must be also be real ministerial accountability. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance would not stake her reputation on the revised timescales she announced to Parliament last month. Perhaps when the Cabinet Secretary closes this debate, she will confirm if that is still the case. But the truth is that responsibility for this fiasco goes straight to the top. There has been a ministerial merry-go-round throughout this fiasco, from Alex Salmond in 2014 to Derek Mackay, Nicola Sturgeon launching one of the ferries before it was done with painted-on windows, Fiona Hislop, Michael Matheson, Hamza Youssef and Graham Day have all come and gone. Jenny Gilruth is now the Transport Minister, and today Ivan McKee and Kate Forbes are speaking for the Government. President Officer, it is the Scottish Government who are ultimately responsible for the procurement of these vessels, and it is the First Minister who is ultimately responsible for the Scottish Government. So Labour are again calling on the First Minister to take direct ministerial responsibility. No more buck passing, no more blame shifting. It is time for real accountability. So today we ask Parliament to support our calls for the First Minister to assume responsibility for the Ferguson's fiasco. Finish these ferries, do it right, do it transparently, and do what it takes to bring this scandal to an end. Finally, President Officer, the Lib Dems rightly asked whether or not there will be ministerial resignations if there are any more costs or any more delays. Let me be clear, I do not think it matters how the Scottish Government vote today. I do not think it matters what the Scottish Government say today. If there are any further delays or cost overruns, then the public, who have paid the cost of this Government's failure, will expect resignations. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jamie Halper Johnston. Presiding officer, early this month I visited Ferguson Marine with a number of colleagues, and I'm sure that, like me, well disappointed with the delays in building the ferries on time and to budget, the determination of both the new chief executive, David Tideman, his management team and the workers to deliver the Glen Sanex into service by next spring and eight oh two six months later was impressive. Mr Tymon discussed the well-known trials and tribulations of the ferries contract and spoke passionately and in great detail about how construction of the vessels will successfully be concluded in FMEL's ambitious future plans. A visit to the Glen Sanex itself made clear the work being undertaken to complete construction by the 462 employees, 43 of them apprentices, rising soon to 58, backed by 250 contractors and a strong supply chain. FMEL is now working closely with Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited and Scottish Ministers. Of course, the yard wouldn't even exist if the contract for the two boats had not been awarded to FMEL, and all political parties in this chamber supported the decision at that time. The Tories may drone on about CMAL's concerns now, but I don't recall that being the position then. Hindsight is always in 2020 vision. The Tory position is simply opportunistic, nothing more. As for suggesting FMEL should have been awarded the Isla Ferry contract, given that the Tories argued FMEL should not be building the Glen Sanks in 2 I wonder how that would work, as the yard, its workforce and skills would no doubt have vanished years ago. 
The Glen Sanex will carry up to 1,000 passengers on 127 cars between Ardrossan and Brodick, greatly increasing capacity and resilience. The vessel is now more than 80 per cent complete and expected to enter service in March uh, to May 2023. Ensuring that happens is the yard's overriding priority. Barbara McIntyre, Head of Engineering, explained that beyond the ferry contract, the yard is not standing still. It is currently bidding for the construction of offshore patrol vessels for the navies of Bangladesh, Ghana and Nigeria, which perceive public ownership as a major advantage for FMEL. However, it is pointed out that the relentless criticism of FMEL by opposition politicians in this chamber is being used by commercial rivals in Italy and France against FMEL. The company anticipates securing orders from the Scottish Government for its seven and three small ferry programme and stressed that its vital orders are placed for these vessels soon if the is to maintain its order book beyond October next year. There are challenges, I know, but a commitment to that from the Scottish Government today would be helpful. FMEL also plan to bid for 40 to 80 metre ferries and offshore wind supply vessels. For my Arran constituents, however, the priority is that the Glenis Sanax enters service. The situation on Arran at present is awful. On one of the busiest days of the year, Easter Sunday, the Caledonian Isles broke down. The loss of capacity has been huge, with only the MV Isle of Arran taking the strain. CalMAC say that in relation to bookings, prioritising lifeline supplies and travel, such as medical appointments, family emergencies for each sailing, is being done on a case-by-case -case basis. However, for many islanders, travellers and businesses, the hard work of CalMAC port staff is not enough. It is chaos for many who are missing vital engagements to the mainland and fear they will be stranded if they do travel. Additional capacity is urgently required. High tides have impacted both the Lacranza to Clunig and Adros and Debrodic routes. Islanders now fear to plan ahead. This was epitomised only last week by CalMAC Chief Executive Robbie Drummond. The Isle of Arran Ferry Committee and I were due to meet him on 11th of April at 5pm in Brodick. Less than half an hour before the meeting, Mr Drummond cancelled, fearing the 7.20pm from Brodick wouldn't sail. It did sail, but what does that say about the service that its Chief Executive has little faith in it? Islanders, uh, Islanders on Arran, Cumbria and elsewhere are utterly exasperated, angry and frustrated by the endless cancellations which disrupt their lives week in, week out and have done for many months and indeed several years. They want solutions from the Scottish Government and Minister, they want the solutions from the Scottish Government now. And just before I conclude, I wish to apologise for not taking interventions. I like to do so, but with four minutes, it's not always possible. Thanks. Thank you. I call Jimmy Halper Johnston to be followed by Alistair Allen. Presiding officer, um, although we've discussed the ferries scandal a number of times before, I welcome today's debate because every week seems to bring further revelations and attempts by the Scottish Government to avoid its responsibility. As an islander, no one needs to tell me the critical importance of the ferries to the communities they serve, and it's something that simply cannot be understated. As just one example, and I've often referenced the important role that ferries play in allowing people to access public services, and it was touched upon by Alex Cole Hamilton and Graham Simpson earlier. And of course, only last week, the support group Aaron Cancer Support gave a stark reminder of what this can mean beyond this chamber. The group pointed to its own figures showing half, half of important medical appointments on the mainland had been missed in February, as ferry disruption was rife. And of course, this week, the MV Caledonian Isles is out of action with a smaller vessel covering the route, its decreased capacity further impacting on availability. This only highlights the limited resilience of the CalMAC fleet and the utter mess the Scottish Government has made of the replacement programme. Because the new vessel scheduled to take the route and serve Arran is the infamous Glen Sanox, launched by the First Minister, its windows painted on for the occasion, and now sitting unfinished in the yard years later. That's just one route. But how many lifeline services used for accessing vital services have been similarly impacted? And how many people in our islands and remote areas have been similarly disadvantaged? That is more than enough to call this a scandal, and a scandal entirely of this Scottish Government's making. A result of the incompetence of successes ministers and the decisions of the First Minister who appointed them. Yet at the weekend, as Graham Simpson highlighted, the First Minister was asked if she would go further than her previously stated expression of regret over this situation and apologise. Apologise on behalf of her government to islanders. Her reply, quoted in the Scotsman, was rather less conciliatory. A visibly frustrated First Minister, the newspaper reported, replied, oh, for goodness sake. She then added, well, look, you can't decide to make comments about the words. I choose my words. Well, one word the First Minister chose not to use was sorry. Does this sound like the voice of a Scottish Government that cares about the impact on island communities, like those in Arran, 
or in my home in Orkney or in Shetland or in any of the island communities where there are growing concerns over the future of our vital ferry links. Does it sound like a Scottish Government that truly recognises its role and its responsibility in bringing this situation about? Or one that has its finger on the pulse of these communities? No, it sounds like what it is. A Government that sees the troubles of these communities as little more than a nuisance. A public relations disaster that is frustratingly not disappearing off the agenda. Well, I can assure Ministers, it will not be disappearing off the agenda any time soon. I've spoken about accountability, and that's the key to today's debate. I'd remind the Chamber that the position of the Scottish Government is that everything is on record, that there is nothing more to find, that the position, that position was repeated by the First Minister at the weekend. With this Government, that would be unusual. But we only need to return to the conclusions of the Auditor-General in last month's report to see the true situation. We consider that there should have been a proper record of this important decision. The claim of insufficient documentary evidence will be a familiar one to anyone who has tried to pursue the Scottish Government on any issue. But these are vital concerns about the use of large sums of public money. And yet the First Minister claims the public know, knows that there is everything there is to know. But I don't think anyone in our islands, or even here in this chamber, really believes that. There will be much more to say during the debate on what details are absent and how this remarkable situation came about. But today the Scottish Conservatives have come to the chamber with two specific demands in our amendment. The first is for a clear answer to that question above, why CML's concerns were overruled in making the contract award and why no proper records were kept of this decision. And secondly, for the Scottish Government to re release the full EY report on Project Neptune now. Presiding officer, this has been a depressing episode and it continues to be so. It's not just a regional issue, it has resonated with people across Scotland, those who sympathise with the plight of remote island communities, those angry with hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money wasted, those who have watched as yet another Scottish Government project is turned into an unavoidable, expensive fiasco, and those who have seen have SNP ministers there, try Mr. to cover Halper up Johnson. their responsibility for it. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Mercedes Bialba. Presiding Officer, the Transport Minister was recently in my constituency to hear about the challenges that different communities face on the ferries front. I know that her visit was appreciated and the meeting I chaired in Tarbert Harris was certainly a productive one. That island, Harris uh, and North Uist, share a ferry with services between Tarbert, Lochmadie and Uig and Skye, forming the so-called Uig Triangle, uh, a route for which uh, the vessel 802 is intended. The investment which the Scottish Government has put into the rebuilding of both Tarbert and Uig uh, as harbours in recent years is very significant, and that inevitably means that later this year Uig will be closed for some months. Harris, of course, has a land border with Lewis, and I have registered my concerns already about what will happen if, during the period when the Uig to Tarbert service is out of action, we try to squeeze all the Tarbert traffic onto the existing service from Stornoway to Ullapool during that time. This would mean that a population of some 20,000 people would be entirely dependent on a single fallible vessel for several months. No other population, even approaching that size, is in a similar position on any other CalMAC route. I struggle to see how this is viable unless CalMAC can allocate more capacity to the Stornoway route during that period. Now, all of that brings us, of course, to the urgency of finding new additional tonnage whether through charter or purchase, and I again make the case uh, for that option to be pursued. Again, I know that the Minister and her predecessor have been active on that front. The acquisition of MV Lochfriza from Norway will certainly directly benefit my constituents, as MV Lord of the Isles will be freed up to deliver additional services to South Uist. The entire network will also benefit from the increased resilience which an additional vessel affords. The Scottish Government has undertaken a number of short-term charters of the MV Arrow uh, in addition to that to enhance freight capacity on the Stornoway Ullapool route. And while I know that, that may not be an option or while it may not be an option to purchase that particular vessel, again I, I make the case because there is a strong case to be made for Stornoway permanently to host a freight vessel. In the longer term, it is my belief that North Uist and Harris require a vessel each during the busy summer months. At present, these routes, along with several others in my constituency, 
um, are run virtually to full capacity for the entire tourist season, making it difficult for anyone uh, in uh, the islands, anyone living in the islands, uh, to book their car onto a ferry for weeks on end. Prior to the introduction of MV Loch Seaforth and Stornoway, these routes actually carried more, more cars than the stornoway ullapool route. And I have no doubt that the introduction of vessel 802 will see a similar increase in traffic, though only with separate vessels uh, will it be that each community can see uh, the capacity and resilience that each deserves. So the recent orders for replacement vessels in Isla are very welcome, but in the short term, however, and particularly in the context of the new Clyde and Hebrides ferry services contract, we need to have a serious discussion about how to ensure that islanders have something nearer a level playing field with tourists when it comes to booking tickets. At present, in summer, the, field, the playing field slopes away from island customers at an even sharper angle than that of the famous pitch of Eriski Football Club. While it is questionable whether the motion before us here today is actually motivated by any such practical concerns as the ones I have outlined, today does provide an opportunity for island MSPs to talk about the real and very urgent needs of their own communities. Thank you. And I call Mercedes Bialba to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Thank you. Presiding officer, it was right that Ferguson Marine was brought into public ownership because the closure would have led to the loss of hundreds of skilled jobs and would have further weakened Scotland's industrial base. But while public ownership is welcome, the Scottish Government's mismanagement of Ferguson Marine is not. They could have used public ownership of the company to drive the development of a national ferry procurement and building programme. They could have worked with trade unions and workers to transform Ferguson Marine into a vital publicly owned industrial asset. Instead, the Scottish Government has mismanaged Ferguson Marine, leaving us with continuing delays, secrecy over procurement and a lack of long-term vision for the company. We remain in a position where neither of the two vessels have been delivered. Their construction has been subject to repeated delays, while costs continue to increase as parts degrade, redesigns take place and items fall out of warranty. And the Scottish Government's ownership of Ferguson Marine has exacerbated these delays due to poor planning and ineffective management. But we should reflect on the fact that it is those communities who rely on ferry services who are truly bearing the brunt of this delay. So what we need is for the Scottish Government to take urgent action to ensure that the two vessels are delivered without further delay. But the Scottish Government also has questions to answer over procurement decisions relating to Ferguson Marine. Audit Scotland's report highlights that ministers awarded a contract to a builder that couldn't meet the basic contract guarantees. Ministers also signed up to a contract which committed public funds without public accountability. And warnings from Transport Scotland and CMAL to retender the contract were ignored, with ministers pressing on at a cost to the public of £250 million. And despite their commitment to open government, ministers have failed to make public all of the information relating to their decisions on this contract. So that's why Labour is calling for a public inquiry into the failings of the procurement of this contract. But the experience of Ferguson Marine emphasises the need for a long-term strategy for Scotland's shipbuilding industry. In March, Audit Scotland called for Transport Scotland to finalise the long-term plan and investment programme for ferries by the end of this year. The Scottish Government must ensure that trade unions and workers are able to input into this process so that what emerges is a truly national ferry procurement and building programme. We must also begin to think about the long-term governance of our ferry network. The Scottish Tories have called for CMAL to be privatised, but this is the wrong approach. Labour want to see a new governance framework established which prioritises the needs of passengers and communities who rely on the ferry network. We need a long-term vision for Scotland's ferry services, and I look forward to tomorrow's members' business debate, led by Katie Clark, on this very subject. 
So to conclude, presiding officer, Ferguson Marine must remain publicly owned, but it must also receive ongoing investment because the alternative is stark. A failure to invest in Ferguson Marine will cost vital shipbuilding jobs and skills in Scotland. And that would be an act of industrial vandalism, which this Parliament cannot allow to happen. Thank you. And I call Beatrice Wisher to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was asked during last year's election campaign why I keep speaking about transport. I was surprised that I had to explain that without good, reliable transport links to the mainland and beyond, islands, wherever they are, cannot survive and thrive. The Calmac shambles has left lifeline services in chaos, with people unable to get home for days on end, important, impo important appointments missed, while businesses are on their knees because they can't get the stock and materials they need. The West Coast situation is intolerable and protracted, and people's lives have been severely disrupted. If you'll allow me, I will highlight the Shetland case, where ongoing concerns have been raised repeatedly with the Scottish Government. Shetland is served by one ferry route. Our islands face freight capacity issues and limitations on passenger cabin and car capacity on the overnight crossing. The seafood sector is responsible for around one third of Shetland's economic output, generating hundreds of skilled jobs and supporting an extensive local supply chain. Findings from Seafood Shetland in 2021 compared freight capacity with our closest neighbour, Orkney, which has freight capacity on 80 scheduled sailings per week. Contrast this with Shetland's freight capacity of 24 scheduled sailings a week, less than one-third capacity for Shetland when compared to Orkney, and potentially around 400 more trailers could be moved in a week than in Shetland. The Stuart Building Transport Group commissioned a study which looked at the current and short-term future position for freight capacity on the Northern Isles Ferry Service, and the study's findings showed that six in ten northbound sailings are running at 90% capacity, with one in ten over the allotted capacity. Hauliers are told that there's sufficient capacity across the week, but that doesn't help get all goods away on Mondays and Tuesdays to meet deadlines further south, or bring in northbound freight, including the return of empty freight empty trailers on Sundays or Mondays at the beginning of the working week. More freight capacity for Shetland's thriving economy is needed now, but until new vessels are introduced on the Northern Isles route, the charter of an additional freight vessel would be an interim solution. I understand that in freight terms, the aberdeen lerwick aberdeen route is the highest earning route in the Scottish Island ferry network, generating an excess of £10 million a year. Shetland's economy simply cannot grow unless there is the freight capacity to accommodate it. There's yearly pinch points, such as during the livestock period, so seasonal capacity must be increased ahead of time to limit disruption. Shetland's hosted two new fish markets in Lerwick and Scalloway, with the possibility to host 600,000 boxes a year. That's yet to be realised because of the pandemic, but we could see this materialise very quickly. Fresh fish can't wait and has to be transported as soon as possible, so increased freight capacity is vital. And it's not just exports, with ongoing construction projects contributing nationally to provide clean energy and the development of the nationally important spaceport, as well as being a hub for the oil and gas industry, capacity is ever more precious. So I have every sympathy with those living in other islands such as Arne. Their experiences are familiar to people in Shetland. The West Coast Ferry Service scenario must be learnt from. New vessels in northern waters must be appropriate and built and procured in an open process. Islanders don't ask for special treatment, but they do ask that their communities are supported and livelihoods protected. The greater their contribution to Scotland as a consequence. So my overall message today is clear. Island communities across Scotland need reliable and resilient transport connections and greater ferry freight capacity for Shetland now would start to fulfil these needs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, and I call Ariane Burgess, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For those who live and work on the mainland, it can be hard to understand just how important functioning ferry routes are for island communities. Food and supply concerns were forefront of people's minds on my recent visit to Bembecula and South Uist. At a time when the cost of living is soaring, uh, the last thing our island communities need are further price hikes due to goods being in limited supply. I met with people who are alive with innovative ideas to meet the needs of their communities, 
But as I visited the site for a future deep water harbour in Loch Boisdale, I couldn't help but sense that the lack of reliability in our ferry services chokes off this innovation. We need to move from our islands being full of potential to actually being able to deliver what they have to offer. To unlock this potential and reverse the ongoing march of depopulation, Scotland needs a fully functioning, reliable, resilient and green ferry network that is seen as an essential part of our national public transport network. And there has never been a better time to redesign Scotland's ferries network, given the recent nationalisation of ScotRail, thanks to the Scottish Government and the Greens, the stage is set for further transformative changes to our transport systems. Yes, our island communities desperately need new vessels, not least to provide a buffer when another ship needs maintenance. This has been happening far too frequently and causing intolerable disruption to residents, and, as we have heard already, and local businesses, such as in Loch Boisdale, where the ferry has been out of action for the best part of three months. But it's not just about procurement. To get our ferry services fully functioning, we need a comprehensive long-term marine infrastructure plan. This should cover ports, harbours, vessels, offshore renewables, and all components of Scotland's marine infrastructure. As part of this plan, we could establish three standard sizes for new vessels so that they can berth at more part, ports to make it easier for one ferry to substitute for another when it's offline. And we must go further to make our ferries a good green transport option for the 21st century. The significant investment into the sector must be future-proofed by improving connections with public transport networks and making our ferries cleaner and greener to run. A constituent recently wrote to me to express her gratitude that there was a new Mull ferry, but her disappointment that it runs on diesel, while countries like Norway are already, already moving towards zero emissions ferries. It's also vital that we provide free travel on ferries for young people, just as we now provide free bus travel for people under 22, as delivered by the Scottish Greens. I've heard so many stories of how free bus travel has transformed, transformed young people's lives. Let's do that for young people on islands too. Finally, we must ensure that decisions about our ferries best serve the people who use them most. There needs to be more islanders on the CMAL and CalMAC boards. I will work with colleagues in government to feed ideas like these into the upcoming Islands Connectivity Plan and the delivery plan for the strategic Transports Project Review 2 to make Scotland's ferries an asset for the future of our island nation. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches and I call on Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's desperately sad that the mismanagement of the Scottish Government has had such a devastating impact on communities that depend on lifeline ferry, ferry services. £250 million pounds has been squandered and that cost is likely to rise. And as Mercedes Dalab has said, the impact on communities served by these ferries is immeasurable. Businesses losing millions of pounds due to lack of capacity and cancelled ferries. Island food and fish exports are rotting on the pier. This has a direct impact on the island's economy. The social cost is immeasurable and Alec Cold Hamilton talked about that. The allocation of these contracts to Ferguson Marine should have been a step towards building a thriving shipbuilding industry on the Clyde, and the SNP's mismanagement has simply delivered nothing but chaos. Instead of putting this right, they now procure ferries from Turkey rather than the Clyde. What are the working conditions in Turkey? Do they comply with fair work practices? What are the community benefits being provided by those contracts? As Neil Bibby said, we need a full public inquiry into what went wrong. In 2019, Tim Hare was appointed as Turnaround Director in the Yard. Emails obtained through FOI requests show that the appointment was rushed through. Tim Hare was paid £2 million to turn around the Yard, yet the ferries have been delayed yet again. While ministers have come and gone, the First Minister has been a constant presence throughout this fiasco. We need a personal guarantee from her 
that she will take ministerial responsibility for the delivery of these vessels with no more delays. Audit Scotland's damning report highlights how Scottish ministers ignored warnings and awarded the contract to a builder that could not meet basic contract guarantees. Neither Kate Forbes nor Nicola Sturgeon can explain why the normal financial safeguards weren't put in place or why they ignored the warnings from CMA. There is no written evidence as to why ministers pressed ahead and accepted the terms of the contract without a full builder's refund. First Minister says the buck stops with her, but she bears none of the consequences of the huge failure and has then pointed the finger at Derek Mackay. As, Al as Alec Cole Hamilton said, Jim McCall, the previous owner of Ferguson's, has suggested that the contract was awarded for political reasons, but the SNP could announce it at Nicola Sturgeon's first conference. Presiding officer, we believe the First Minister must now show leadership and ensure these ferries are delivered with no further delays and ensure that the reputation of Ferguson's is restored. That she instigates a national ferry procurement and building programme to ensure that Calmat's ageing fleet is renewed and the benefits of these contracts remain in Scotland, as highlighted by Mercedes Villalba. That the structures surrounding our lifeline ferry services are fit for purpose, allowing Calmat to work with the communities they serve to build ferries that these communities need. And finally, we need a public inquiry so that the lessons are learned and we never see a fiasco like this repeated again in the future. Thank you. And I call on Liam Kerr. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, two themes which have come through loud and clear this afternoon. The first is the litany of failures that have characterised this matter since John Swinney first proudly announced in 2014 that the SNP would replace 12 ferries for £250 million. Subsequently, of course, that was scaled back to two ferries for £97 million. Two ferries, the Glen Sanex and Hull 802, which will not be in service until next year at the earliest. Now, these are failures such as delays in the installation of pipework, up to 939 electrical cable coils, which are too short, not installing a ducktail, which reduces resistance and thus fuel use, even though the previous yard owners said six years ago they were required not actually running the dual fuel engines, which now may not even work and which are now out of warranty. And it's terrifying. The minister admitted earlier he didn't even know about this and not building the bunkering facilities in our Drossen or Uig required for the LNG. I will. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful for my colleague to give, take an intervention. I wonder if he's aware that the Glen Sanox is due to enter service between a Drossen and Brodick, but actually the ship is too big to dock in a Drossen, and the Scottish Government are yet to offer a solution to this problem. Liam Kerr. I'm grateful to the member for, for his intervention. I am aware of this, um, and the member is absolutely right to be concerned, because I think I heard at finance questions earlier on that there isn't even a budget to carry out the work that's going to be required. So hopefully the Cabinet Secretary will address this in closing. Now, all of this, presiding officer, comes at a cost of £250 million, which may well rise to £400 million. But the second thread running through this is epitomised by the tone of the SNP amendment, because what it and the SNP speakers like Kenny Gibson fail to do is either accept agency or responsibility for this shambles. In fact, Ivan McKee let the cat out of the bag when asserting in his amendment that much of the recent debate relates to information that has been in the public domain for two years. Now, leaving aside that some may question the accuracy of that assertion, remember Nicola Sturgeon, who ran the same line, followed up, it's just that nobody has chosen to make it what it's been, and that's up to the media and opposition politicians. So the SNP case is that we are blowing this out of proportion. And that is truly shameful and disrespectful to islanders and the people directly suffering the consequence of this, as Alex Cole-Hamilton rightly pointed out in his opening remarks. And ultimately, as we've heard, this abdication of responsibility goes right to the top, with the First Minister initially refusing to say who was responsible, who green-lighted the contracts, then later throwing Derek Mackay under the bus. Yet, when it was pointed out that he was on holiday at the time, Hamza Youssef suggested it was Keith Brown who signed. Then Jim McCall, the Yard's former owner, said the decision to ignore uh, that CMAL couldn't provide the mandatory refund guarantees 
was made by one Nicola Sturgeon. And of course, it was John Swinney who signed the cheques. All senior ministers, bar one, of course, who sit comfortably in this place now, pointing at each other, muttering, it was near me. Yet it is Kate Forbes who might have to carry the can. She wasn't even here when this all started. President officer, speaker after speaker has exposed that there is a rotten culture of deflection, obfuscation and prevarication at the heart of this SNP government, which gives no one, least of all the islanders suffering this debacle, any confidence whatsoever it will be sorted any time soon. The Liberal Democrat motion is absolutely correct to demand both delivery and accountability. And that starts with the publication of the Project Neptune report, as called for in the Conservative Amendment, and the public inquiry that Neil Bibby demanded earlier on. That's why Parliament should vote for the motion today and the Conservative and Labour amendments today and get this ferry fiasco yeah. sorted. Thank you. I now call on Kate Forbes. I'm up to five minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As many members have already said, for our island communities, ferries are as critical as roads and rail and bus links elsewhere on main Scotland, if not more important, because they are nearly always the only route. They are relied on for access to employment, health provision, education, and to see loved ones. Breakdowns and cancellations are deeply regrettable, to put it mildly. And indeed, in the last debate on this very subject a matter of weeks ago, both the Transport Minister and I apologised unreservedly on two separate occasions to those island communities. Indeed, during the April recess that's just passed, I visited constituents travelling by the very vessels on which they rely. And I know colleagues in the chamber who represent island communities will have done likewise not least Alistair Allen and Kenny Gibson, who mentioned some solutions and suggestions to improve uh, vessel connectivity in their own constituency. And these are all worthy of urgent consideration by CalMac and Transport Scotland. Scrutiny in this parliament is vitally important, demonstrated by this being uh, another uh, debate on this important issue. But arguably, scrutiny by the public is even more important still and listening directly to those communities matters enormously. Over the last few years, we have sought to deliver considerable growth in services underpinned by significant investment in vessels and infrastructure. And we've also identified substantial funds, not least in the most recent budget, to invest further in enhancing the resilience of the fleet, including procuring new vessels. That's already seen orders placed for two new vessels for Isla, as well as investment in ports in Uig, Loch Madi, and Tarbert. That work is already well underway, as is the designs for the small vessel replacement programme. And that presiding officer brings me to Ferguson Marine. I've already set out the scale of the challenge we took on when we rescued Ferguson's from administration in 2019. We did so, and this is important, we did so in order to complete vessels 801 and 802 on behalf of the very communities that rely on them. But we also saved hundreds of jobs and the future of commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde. It was the right thing to do. And we stand by our commitment to those shipbuilding communities in Inverclyde and to our island communities that rely on the vessels the Yard will deliver. And I was pleased that opposition MSPs had the opportunity to visit the Yard just a few weeks ago and see the vessels directly and to hear from the new chief executive about what work is underway. The challenges have been great. Progress has not been as fast as we would have liked. I have made my views abundantly clear to the chief executive and the chair that these vessels must be delivered. The board is ultimately required to deliver on our clear expectations for the business. Those expectations are threefold. One, they must complete those vessels successfully and at the fastest, most achievable pace. Two, they must make the yard competitive, productive and efficient. And three, they must win further work on the basis of the yard's ability to deliver. And I'm heartened by reports uh, from those that visited the yard that progress can be seen, that progress is tangible. And that is in line with the Audit Scotland recommendation, which states, and I, I quote, the turnaround of FMPG is extremely challenging, but 
FMPG has implemented some of the significant operational improvements that were required at the shipyard. So we will drive this process forward to ensure that Ferguson is an efficient and effective shipbuilder. Presenting officer, before I close, I want to turn to the, the claims around lack of transparency. There have been two proactive releases of documents chosen by government to be released, some 210 documents in total. Those have willingly been put into the public domain with the express intention of enhancing the public's understanding of what we are trying to achieve and the processes in place. The Scottish Parliament inquiry, followed by the Audit Scotland report, are useful. They are difficult to read in places in terms of uh, the hugely challenging uh, situation that has been created. Equally, they have clear recommendations, many of which have already been taken forward. And lessons have been learned, not least in the most recent procurement exercise and also in the way that the Scottish Government invests in private companies. Things have not progressed as we might have hoped, but progress is being made on arguably the most important element in all of that, and that is to complete these vessels as quickly as possible. It's taken a mammoth effort by all involved to get the yard moving and to build the ships that we need. Much work remains to be done both to deliver the vessels and to make the yard efficient and competitive. The scale of that challenge is not in question, but it is a challenge that we're committed to meeting for the sake of those who depend on the ferry services. I know it's a a challenge that David Tideman, the new chief executive, if is willing conclude, to make. If you conclude, please, Cabinet and those, Secretary. And as I close, um, I uh, uh, close by saying that we are committed to resolving that. Thanks. Thank you. I now call on Willie Rennie to close the debate. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thought Kenny Gibson summed up the situation extremely well. He said the situation on Arran was awful. He said it was chaos and he demanded urgent action from the government, his own SNP government. Contrast that with Alistair Allen. Not a peep of criticism of the government for the delays that directly affect his constituency. I will give way in a second. Just like all the other supine backbenchers this afternoon who have not uttered a word of criticism from the government. I will take an intervention. Alistair well, Allen. I, I don't mean to read out my speech all over again, but you will have heard criticism of the situation with specific routes in my constituency, uh, with the, the lack of uh, service and with the lack of service specifically that there is pl currently planned for uh, Tarbuck to Uig. So I, I really think that's just inaccurate and he might want to reconsider it. it it's, well, not, it's not inaccurate in any way. There was not one word of criticism from the government for the delays to the ferries that have led to the situation in his constituency. And if he's going to stand up for his constituents, he should stand up to the government. Alex Cole Hamilton referred to the Open Government Action Plan from the Scottish Government. It's a riveting read, I can guarantee and I can recommend it. As ever they claim, it's world-leading and pioneering. It boldly states that an open government gives the public information about the decisions it makes, supports people to understand and influence those decisions, and this is the best bit, and values and encourages accountability. And despite what Ivan McKee said in his opening remarks, the government have failed on every single term of this document. Take Project Neptune. The government agreed to an investigation by Ernst & Young. It's been ready for a long time. Have we seen it, despite repeated promises? No, we haven't. If we've got an open government, they should publish it without delay. Jamie Halcrow Johnson mentioned Audit Scotland. Audit Scotland said there was a lack of transparent decision making. They continued, there is insufficient documentary evidence to explain why Scottish ministers accepted the risks and were content to approve the contract award in October 2015. Kate Forbes said documents were published. Audit Scotland disagree. They say that evidence has not been forthcoming. Where is it? And if it doesn't exist, why on earth did it not exist? This was a critical decision involving hundreds of millions of pounds and two important ferries for the constituents of the members who have spoken this afternoon. We've not seen those documents. 
They should be published without delay if we've got an open government. Then, in a new law, we saw in this very chamber the First Minister point the finger at Derek Mackay, who's no longer here to defend himself. We only discovered later that he wasn't involved in the sign-off, that perhaps it was another minister, but we're still not being told which ministers were responsible. If we've got open government, we need to know exactly which ministers made that decision. So on Project Neptune, on Audit Scotland, on Derek Mackay, the SNP government have been mired in secrecy on this. Yeah. Open government action plan emphasises there must be accountability. But despite the delays, the cost overruns, the waste of public funds, the betrayal of the shipyard workers and the islanders who are still waiting, no minister has been held accountable. Accountability is at the heart of our democratic system. If ministers think that their jobs are secure, no matter how many cock-ups they make, no matter how many mistakes they make, no matter how many things they get wrong, then our democracy is fatally undermined. Yet no minister has resigned. Other politicians have resigned for far less. David McCletchy resigned because of taxi bills. Henry McLeish went as a result of his office rent in Glenrothes. Wendy Alexander went for £995. SNP ministers waste hundreds of millions of pounds, but everyone keeps their job, their salary and their ministerial car. What will it take for ministers to resign? How bad does it have to get? Will the cost go to £260 million? or 300 million, or 400 million, or will they keep their jobs no matter how high the price goes? If the construction is delayed by another three months, or a year, or two years, will anybody go? Will the minister resign if future ferry contracts don't go to Ferguson's, just like the ones that have gone off to Turkey? I bet you they don't. There's not a chance the minister's going to resign in this government because they're more interested in looking after themselves than actually serving the public in this country. The minister, the first minister, doesn't think it's bad enough yet. Boris Johnson is refusing to resign no matter how many party gate fines he gets. But I don't think the moral backbone of Boris Johnson was the gold standard for which the SNP aspired to. So I think we should be told, will any minister be held to account for this utter shambles? Four years late, three times over budget, islanders are without lifeline services, and the reputation of a shipyard with a proud heritage trashed by terrible leadership. And the response from the SNP government just be grateful. It could have been worse. Let the minister tell the taxpayer they should be grateful because it could have been worse. Tell the desperate care workers who are desperate for a pay rise that it could have been worse. Tell the islanders stuck at harbours waiting on their broken ferries to be fixed once again that it could have been worse. Tell the shipyard workers who see orders for new ferries Mr. heading Rennie. for Turkey because the government-owned yard didn't even bid for them. Tell them that it could have been worse. This is arrogance from an SNP government that has been in power for far too long. You will they should to be conclude, held Mr. to Rennie. account and they should resign you if they conclude. do not get this fixed. Mr Rennie. That concludes the debate on economy ferries. It is now time to move on to the next item of business which is consideration of business motion 4077 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President uh, Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. I note that no member is asked to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 4077 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 4078 and 4079 on stage two timetables for bills. I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motions to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motions. And once again, President Officer, moved. Thank you, Minister. No member is asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 4078 and 4079 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed.
The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 4080 and 4081 on approval of SSIs. All moves, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there are nine questions to be put as a result of today's business. And can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Shona Robison is agreed to, then the amendment in the name of Liz Smith will fall. And the first question is that amendment 4050.3 in the name of Shona Robison, which seeks to amend motion 4050 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on economy, cost of living crisis, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. So there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system. <laughs>